the good name is intrepid anywhere you are in the world. If you get locked up or you're in jail or whatever, call me and help will be on the way. Ian Fleming said James Bond is a highly romanticized version of a true spy. The real thing is Bill Stevenson. I didn't meet him till I'd been working for him for quite a long time. And when I was finally ushered into this large office of his in Rockefeller Center, um, I got quite a shock. From the 36th floor of Rockefeller Center in New York, under the guise of British passport control, Bill Stevenson and his agents were involved in almost every aspect of intelligence work. Coding, forgery, counter-espionage and propaganda. How did a boy from Winnipeg end up at the heart of international intrigue? Stevenson, intrepid, was the greatest mystery of all. His most conspicuous quality was an inherent capacity to disappear. Swift as summer lightning, he could make himself invisible. Like the magician's rabbit, he could melt into the mists of night or into the madding crowd of Fifth Avenue with the speed of a jet without a sound. No, he wasn't the magician's rabbit. He was the magic. Everyone could feel it. No one can explain it. I think the, the genius of people who work in that art, espionage, and it is an art, not a science in, in my judgment, is they have an ability to absorb knowledge very quickly, to gather information, analyze that information, interpret that information, and form a judgment in a way which most of us don't. World War II was one of the most valuable military victories of modern history. A number of countries pulled together, and in that, pulling together, the pulling together the intelligence services was critical. And so William's role in that is undeniable and unarguable. Sir William Samuel Stevenson, the celebrated spy master who became an inspiration for Ian Fleming's James Bond. Some have said he was the pivotal person who helped save England and defeat the Nazis. Yet much that has been written about him is fiction. In two best-selling biographies, all the information on Stevenson's youth is fictitious. His parents' names are wrong. His date of birth is wrong. The school he was supposed to have graduated from did not exist. In wartime, Churchill said, the truth was so precious it had to be surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. Bill Stevenson said, nothing deceives like a document. When he, he walked, you know, as though he had uh, little springs under the balls of his feet, even when he walked across his office to shake hands with you. And um, very pale eyes. And unlike most small men, he never stuck his head up to look at you like that. He kept his chin right in and only his eyes, which was very, very pale, his eyes went up and looked at you. And he never raised his voice, ever. One sensed always that one was dealing with a man of uh, far-sighted, experience and uh, imagination. He was not a writer, not a talker, but he was an activist, whether it was in business or intelligence. Long before anybody else uh, came up with it, he had this idea of, of one world of uh, trading and, and uh, industrializing uh, countries. He was a tough little mother. You were never really conscious of size with, with Sir William Stevenson. He was a bit like a Jack Russell Terrier. If you know anything about Jack Russells, they all think they're 10 foot tall, and every dog or thing they encounter think they're 10 foot tall too. So it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the amount of fight in the dog. Winnipeg, Manitoba, at the beginning of the 20th century, was a frontier boomtown. Immigrants from around the world seeking a new life streamed into the prairie capital. Among the new Canadians were William Stanger from the Orkney Islands and his Icelandic wife, Christine Johnson. Stanger found work as a labourer at Winnipeg's Ogilvy Mills. It was a tough early life. On the 23rd of January, 1897, their son, William Samuel Clouston Stanger was born. 
His father died when he was three years old. Bill's mother was too poverty stricken to care for all her kids. She gave Bill to her friend, Kristen Stevenson, to raise as her own. There was quite a tradition in, in Icelandic families that you took in individuals, whether they were family members or others from the community, and made them members of your family. And we understand that uh, my, my great aunt took in Sir William and, uh, and then later adopted him and he became a Stevenson. Well, in those days, they, they didn't have many toys or anything, and they used to play whatever games they could. Well, the game they used to play is see what object is moved. And uh, the person would have to leave the room, and somebody would go and move an object or take it completely away, and then they would bring him back into the room, and he would have to identify the object that was either moved or taken away and inevitably he would, he would come up with the answers and he'd always win at this game. That same photographic memory involved him in the capture of a wanted local outlaw. John Kravchenko was a bank robber and a murderer who'd recently escaped from custody. Young Bill Stevenson was working for the Great Northwest Telegraph Company when he recognized Kravchenko from a wanted poster. The boy reported what he'd seen to the police, and Kravchenko was arrested. For his own protection, Stevenson's name was never publicized, so beginning his life of secrecy. In 1914, the First World War broke out. Two years later, Stevenson enlisted in the 101st Battalion Winnipeg Light Infantry. He briefly served in France, where he was gassed. He was later hospitalized in Britain. While recovering, he took flying lessons. He learned quickly and went on to earn the Military Cross and Distinguished Flying Cross as a fighter pilot. In the windswept open cockpits of those early fighter planes, Canadian flyers fought the first dogfights, writing a new and splendid chapter in the history of the air. This officer has shown conspicuous gallantry and skill in attacking enemy troops and transports from low altitudes, causing heavy casualties. His reports also have contained valuable and accurate information. I was leading a flight, and you were right there, giving your usual delicate loving brush to the outer strut of my starboard wingtip. A Hun sat on the tail of a B flight boy just below us. And when I saw his tracer ripping the camel from tail to cockpit, I decided to do the same to the Hun from about 18,000. Tommy crashed and was sent to the POW camp at Holzminden of unhappy memory. From where I later escaped, you, my dear, indeed my dearest pal, are the warmest memory I have of that awful thing called the First World War. Affectionately, Bill. It was his time in the German prisoner of war camp that sparked his career in business. Before he escaped, Stevenson secretly pocketed an unusual kitchen utensil. After the war, he brought it back to Winnipeg and patented the clean-cut can opener. With his friend, Wilf Russell, he founded the Franco-British Supply Company. My grandfather and Sir William were the best of childhood friends. After the war, they formed a business and made can openers, amongst other things. We understand that uh, this, this can opener was taken by Sir William Stevenson from a German prisoner of war camp, and he gave it to my grandfather, who had invested in Stevenson Russell uh, to the tune of about $1,000 in stocks and, and possibly more in terms of loans. And uh, this is basically what we have in return for, for my grandfather's investment. The business, based on the German tool, failed within a year. Despite the bankruptcy, Stevenson resumed business in England, specializing in the new field of electronics. Although he had no formal training, he was able to improve a method to send pictures via wireless and patented the process. In 1923, Stevenson was quoted in London papers and also in a South Carolina paper as predicting the time when we will be able to see moving pictures in our house. Now, what Stevenson had done had been to reduce significantly the amount of time taken 
between the taking of a picture and the transmission of the picture to the point where one could develop and deliver pictures in real time. That same year, Stevenson and Russell took their new machines to Toronto's Canadian National Exhibition. On their return trip to England, they met two sisters from Tennessee, heiresses to a tobacco fortune. Stevenson was especially taken with Mary French Simmons. The family history records a somewhat whirlwind romance. Uncle Billy and Aunt Simps were married by the captain on the ship. Now, my grandfather and my grandmother waited a little bit longer. The official record tells another story, that Bill and Mary were actually married the following year in London. If you look at it carefully, the marriage certificate is full of errors. His age is wrong. His father's name is wrong. His father's occupation is wrong. The street address where he's supposed to have lived, he didn't live there. Nothing deceives like a document. In England, Stevenson rapidly became a successful entrepreneur with enterprises including Earl's Court and Shepperton Studios, then the largest studios outside Hollywood. As a partner with A.J. Taylor and others, he helped develop the elite British properties residential section of Vancouver and the Lionsgate Bridge. His interests even then were global. I have this letter that I received from uh, Stevenson in, in 1933, and uh, I, I was 12 that year. And he's on a trip to India to talk about developing industry. And here's what he writes to me. My dear Betty, I was so pleased to receive your letter this morning. I've been traveling a lot and very busy. I have been right up in the Himalaya mountains in little Tibet. You will see where that is on your atlas. We are now the guest of His Highness, the Nawa of Bhopal. This is a lovely place and I'm sure you would like it. I'm glad to hear you are collecting stamps and so that you will receive several. I am writing on this heavy paper. We'll send Nita and Jane, those are my sisters, some postcards as soon as I get back. And meanwhile, with love to you all, I am your old Uncle Bill. By the mid-1930s, Adolf Hitler was Germany's Chancellor and its Führer. Many Britons, including Prime Ministers Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain, sought to avoid conflict and appease him. Stevenson, on the other hand, was suspicious. He witnessed firsthand the build-up of the Nazis and reported back to democratic forces in Britain. Bill had not been a professional intelligence man prior to the onset of war. He had, however, been engaged in uh, collecting and delivering intelligence on uh, German armament production in the 30s. In the guise of being a tourist in Germany, he bought a Leica camera. He had the notion that Hitler was rearming, and he thought it was imperative to take back photo evidence to Winston Churchill. So to pass as a tourist in an area where he would not have been welcome, he got this German camera. It was the beginning of Stevenson's life underground. Files and photos began mysteriously to disappear. Earl's Court has no record of who built it. Shepperton Studios have no record of ownership before the war. At about the same time, his relatives in Winnipeg stopped hearing from him. We never were aware that he was in town until after we might see a picture in the paper that he'd been in town or things of that nature. But really, uh, there was no, uh, no real contact with the family to the best of my knowledge. I didn't know what to think. But I thought, well, there must be some reason that he's keeping his solitude and quietness. When Germany began invading neighboring countries, Britain's future ambassador to the United States, Lord Lothian, seemed unconcerned. He commented, after all, they're only going into their own back garden. But Stevenson had witnessed the truth. He sought someone who would speak out against German rearmament. Eventually, his reports found Winston Churchill. With his absolute cleverness, he spotted Churchill as a future leader. I mean, he could have sent them to uh, Chamberlain. 
uh, and he wouldn't have got anywhere. As a member of parliament, Churchill often warned of the Nazi build-up, quoting figures supplied by Stevenson. His career in intelligence had begun. When Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Hitler's plan of conquest could no longer be denied. And on the 3rd, Britain declared war. In May 1940, Winston Churchill succeeded Neville Chamberlain as Prime Minister. Churchill knew that without help from the United States, Britain was doomed. He needed a man he could trust in the US. In choosing Stevenson, Churchill totally circumvented usual British intelligence channels and normal protocol. Stevenson was even eventually given the number 48,000. 48, apparently related to the 48 US states at the time. Zero represented the head and double zero was similar to James Bond. Stevenson had two major tasks when he arrived in New York under cover of British passport control. To get help for Britain and to assist in establishing an American intelligence network. His organization, eventually called British Security Coordination, grew rapidly. Remarkably, it remained secure as his trusted friends hired their trusted friends. Stevenson's wealth helped him get started. Bill was independently wealthy. I've, I've seen a figure, and I don't know where I got it, but that he spent as much as three million of his own money, that he was not paid a salary. And, and so Churchill, uh, he, 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 when he came to getting a chap in, 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 for America, he said, this is the chap for me. I mean, his skill was propaganda. And that's what he was sent to the States for, to mostly counter propaganda, because the German bond was very strong at, at that time. America was a very isolationist country. We believe that our country can be kept from involvement in other people's strife. The attitude of isolationism in this country was strong. It was strong among Italians, it was strong among the Irish, it was strong among the Germans. I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. By the summer of 1940, Hitler's armies had conquered much of mainland Europe. The advancing German army trapped British and French troops on the beaches around Dunkirk. 300,000 were evacuated in what Churchill called a miracle of deliverance. But in America, things were different. 300 spectacular buildings of flashing decoration. The New York World's Fair was held over from 1939. Its utopian theme, the world of tomorrow, futuristic, optimistic. 60 different countries represented and have exhibits. The German, British, Soviet and Japanese pavilions were all within a stone's throw of each other. Yet no stones were thrown. The war in Europe seemed very far away. To help swing the tide of American public opinion, Stevenson's agents began to disseminate anti-Nazi propaganda through radio and the press. Influential columnist Walter Winchell and Roosevelt speechwriter Robert Sherwood were among those who spoke out for intervention. One astonishing BSC operation came to light years after the war. There's a great story about a Nazi map of how the Nazis were going to divide up South America once they took over the country. I have in my possession a secret map made in Germany by Hitler's government, by the planners of the new world order. They have divided South America into five vassal states. That is his plan. It will never go into effect. But the map was a forgery created by Stevenson's agents and planted to mislead the president and America. Nothing deceives like a document. There's no question that the British security coordination uh, carried out things that were often illegal or close to illegal and were certainly nothing other than British intervention in American affairs. Stevenson's organization developed the very best 
uh, teams for illegal entries into consulates and embassies, uh, safe breakers, lock pickers, uh, uh, people very close to a criminal element. Most of the embassies knew that this was going on and they did their best to protect it and to uh, sprinkle powder along to see if there were footsteps in the night and so forth. There's all sorts of games being played. Embassies trying to protect their information and uh, Stevenson and others trying to get at it. It's, um, it is kind of the stuff of, of spy novels. The German wolf pack was decimating Britain's merchant fleet, carrying goods from America to Churchill's island fortress. Using his business acumen and connections, Stevenson lobbied for the crucial land lease and destroyers for bases deals. In exchange for leases on military bases around the world, Britain received essential armaments and convoy escorts from the United States. We shall send you ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. Stevenson's tremendous asset in Washington in those years was that the guy in charge of the American government, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was probably one of the biggest rule breakers of any president. Uh, he had an expression, he said, I don't like to let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. And Stevenson uh, was just the type of guy that Roosevelt wanted to work with. Roosevelt just chuckled every time he heard about something Stevenson did that was not quite proper. He loved it. One obstacle to Stevenson's mission was the Duke of Windsor. His wife, Wallace Simpson, had allegedly had an affair with the German foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop. FBI files even suggested she may have been a German agent. One of the few people who knew of the Nazi sympathy of the British elite at the time was Fulton Orsler. In December of 1940, he went to the Bahamas to interview the Duke of Windsor. During the interview, the Duke asked Orsler to give President Roosevelt a message, stay out of the war. Years later, Orsler's son found his father's diary of the time. He says in there that he thought that uh, he had better play along in the interests of his country. And the Duke went on to say that he felt that Hitler was a great man and the logical leader of Europe. Fulton goes to the White House on the 23rd of December and walks in and says, Mr. President, I still find it hard to believe what I've come to tell you. And Roosevelt said, Fulton, there are people in high places who think that we should not enter the war. And he, in effect, tells my father everything that the Duke had told him. And my father said, Mr. President, you're a telepathist. But when he left, there was a, a little man right by the door. And as my father came out, the little man turned his head away so that Fulton couldn't see who it was. And he concludes the memo by saying, who was he? Only God and Franklin Delano Roosevelt know. I want to talk to you fighting men and women about the battle of the United States. You may want One person who didn't like Stevenson's unorthodox methods was J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. Stevenson needed to negotiate a communications deal that would see British security coordination messages sent back to England using the FBI network. For security reasons, he avoided working through the British Embassy. The British Embassy had problems with security. In fact, one FBI memo says some messages from there were getting straight to Hitler. Hoover had an entirely different ideological view of the war than Stevenson did. The idea of British intelligence coming over here to this country and presuming to operate as freely as Stevenson planned to operate was totally anathema to J. Edgar Hoover. By agreeing to the plan, Hoover did Stevenson a tremendous and risky favor. Four months before Pearl Harbor, not only was the FBI aware of the large British intelligence network covertly operating in the U.S., it was actually working with it. The U.S. was still neutral at the time, 
So Stevenson had to set up his own communication system, and his organization's huge expansion began. The section of British Security Coordination was a top-secret office in a very public place. Guarded by plainclothes policemen, hundreds of staff worked on the mezzanine level of Rockefeller Center in the heart of New York City. Nearly all were women, recruited in Canada, who would become, in fact, secret agents and a source of inspiration for the author Ian Fleming. Young, vibrant and educated, they were sworn to secrecy. Well, uh, when I was hired. I had never been on a plane or a train in my life, and when I hit New York City, it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. People coming and going, some in civilian clothes and some in the Army clothes, Navy, Air Force. We just kept busy. One night, we got off the midnight shift, 8 o'clock in the morning, went to the Paramount Theater. They had a live show interspersed with movies. And we got up from our seats in time to go back to work that night at midnight. <laughs> we went up the huge escalators as you enter 635th Avenue. And we're told to go to a plain door to the left down a corridor. We were looking after intercepted messages, Japanese messages, and uh, had to prepare these to be sent on to Camp X. We didn't know it was Camp X at that time. And it was all very secretive. I have, I have no idea what, what we were typing for. And um, I, I can't really tell you that much about my work because I didn't really know that much about it. Uh, Sir William, he wasn't Sir William then, but he was, he was a very smart man because nobody really knew what the other person was doing in the place. Well, it was great fun, but we were told we could not fraternize with too many of the the other people, which were the Americans. We had been warned not to to speak to strangers, and we pretty well stayed with, within our own group. <laughs> and believe me, I never did talk about it because he told me the ramifications of loose lips, sink ships, and so on. I was given a long, serious talk by someone when I signed the British Secrets Act. And oh, he scared the bejeepers out of me. So I wouldn't have told anybody anything. In fact, for years and years, my parents still didn't know. And I did watch behind my back every once in a while when I get on a bus or something like that. I think, oh, are they following me? Am I doing something I shouldn't be doing? When you were coding, these messages that were marked super secret for your eyes only, which would go through one department and then come to ours, and it was up to me and uh, my friend there to decode them before he could read them. I think that was a great deal of trust to put in young people at that time. Stevenson needed someone to devise a communication system that would help keep his secrets secret. Pat Bailey was from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. He was arguably the most secret man of World War II. During the war and for decades after the war, his position was such that he could not be identified by name. He isn't in any of the books written about Stevenson. Bailey was hired in 1941. He first went to Britain to learn what they were doing in the way of secret communications and breaking the German cipher machine Enigma. He then returned to the U.S. and he learned what the Americans were doing. Bailey took what the British knew and what the Americans knew and created a cryptographer's worst nightmare, an unbreakable cipher machine. Code breaking relies on analyzing the frequency of letters. In English, the most common letters are E, T, A, O and N. When code breakers chart intercepted messages, peaks and valleys form. Then it's possible to break the code letter by letter. The Rockex machines were named after the Radio City Music Hall Rockettes, whose rooftop gymnasium was part of the breathtaking view from Bailey's Rockefeller Center office. Rockex machines created no frequency peaks at all. 
Every letter of the alphabet appeared one twenty-sixth of the time. Bailey also created automatic encipherment, where a message could be typed in, ciphered, and then deciphered across the Atlantic at almost the same speed of speech. If you went through the embassy and had them encipher it, and the foreign office would then decipher it, six hours was a minimum one way, and that meant that to get an answer back took at least 12 hours, where with our automatic encipherment, <laughs> it took a minute. Bailey's unbreakable machines, landlines, and radio network connected New York, Washington, and Ottawa with Camp X and Britain. Hitler's U-boats controlled the North Atlantic, choking supply lines to the British Isles. Nearly 500 American ships were sunk in the first six months after the U.S. entered the war. The Americans needed help to monitor the massive German radio traffic. They turned to Stevenson, Bailey, and their team of Canadians, who were asked to relay U-boats' positions. We had now got to the point where we could break the coding of the submarines, and Hitler insisted that the submarines give their position reports twice a day. So if you could break the code, you knew where the submarines were twice a day. And every Navy had to know where the submarines were so that if they could send ships with depth charges. The convoys from America kept Britain and the hopes of liberating Europe alive. The success of Bailey's communication network has never been revealed in accounts of the war. If mentioned at all, it was referred to as existing British channels. Back in Britain, Stevenson's companies were on a war footing. Earl's Court was converted to a factory making barrage balloons. At Shepperton Studios, set designers helped build a fake attack force, including rubber tanks that were used in a D-Day deception. Another essential task for Stevenson was helping to set up an all-encompassing American intelligence service. He approached someone who he thought would be great for the job, lawyer and war hero Wild Bill Donovan. Well, Bill Donovan, more frequently known as Wild Bill Donovan, became thoroughly focused on the problem of resisting the Nazi assault on the West. And uh, consequently, he and Stevenson had a common approach to a serious worldwide problem. With Roosevelt's approval, Stevenson helped set up Donovan and provided him with secret intelligence previously not available to the US. Both Wild Bill Donovan and Little Bill Stevenson needed a place to train their agents. Sir William realized that he needed a base in Canada to train spies and saboteurs. He needed to have a base very close to the United States. So he called upon Tommy Drewbrook to find the property. It just so happened that there was a parcel of land that was available, which was called the Sinclair Estate, uh, on the shores of Lake Ontario between Whitby and Oshawa, that was perfect uh, for Camp X and what they had in mind for uh, the, the type of training that these agents would go through. If you passed all of the training of Camp X, then you were experienced and proficient in silent killing, which meant that you could kill a man with your bare hands in 15 seconds. You would be proficient with weaponry. You would know something about wireless telegraph, Morse code, you would be able to read a map. You would be an all-round agent and ready to the point where you could take a group of ordinary citizens in an occupied country and give them the same training that you've had and make them proficient in, as, as a, uh, a spy or saboteur. Under the guise of the CBC, it was the control and center of the Hydra operation which was the communications network between Great Britain and North America. Hydra was critical to the war effort. Once it was in operation, top secret messages between North America and Britain went through Camp X. Hundreds of operatives received their training on the site by Lake Ontario, including Ian Fleming and five future heads of the CIA. Europe's day. Long live the cause of freedom.
Allied military victories in the Second World War owe a great deal to superior intelligence. Awarded a knighthood by Britain and the Medal for Merit by the United States, William Stevenson had earned a peaceful retirement. However, a nervous cipher clerk at the Soviet Embassy in Ottawa would carry a tattered briefcase into history and bring Intrepid back into action. Igor Gozenko and Svetlana, his wife, appeared in my office and the, the gentleman looked at me and he said, in difficult English of course, he said, I'm an employee of the Russian embassy and I defected from the embassy last evening with my wife. Igor Gazenko is one of the most misunderstood legendary figures we've got in this country. He launched the Cold War when he revealed the massive Soviet spy network here at a time when nobody wanted to believe that the Soviets were spying. And he had in his coat jacket pocket documents and she had a, an old-fashioned black handbag and it was bulgy, it was, I could see it was absolutely full and it was very old-fashioned type of thing, you know. The police weren't interested, the Mounties weren't interested, the Justice Department weren't interested and it, quite genuinely he was contemplating suicide because he knew that he would be killed when they got him. The documents Guzenko liberated revealed a large Soviet spying in North America focused on atomic secrets. He and his young family were in jeopardy and made an urgent plea to Fernand Coulson at the Ontario Courthouse. So I knew it, the importance of it. Finally, I decided to call Mackenzie King's office and I spoke to his secretary. He said, they have, have nothing to do or nothing to say to that man. Kick him out of your office as soon as you can. I said, really? And I hung up. I was seething by that time. Igor and Svetlana Guzenko sought refuge in a neighbor's home. Guzenko! Oh, that night, Russian agents came looking for them and the stolen documents. Acting on a tip, the Ottawa police arrived and marched the Soviets out. We have every right to be here. Diplomatic community. Fortunately, Stevenson also heard about the Guzenkos. If it hadn't been for Sir William, I think I don't think Gusenko would have survived. We'd have probably put him in a hotel or something, and he'd have eventually, quote, jumped out of the window, like so many did, or had a car accident. Stevenson arranged immediate protection for Gusenko, his pregnant wife, and their infant son, and sent them to the safest safe house around, Camp X. The family grew up under the watchful eye of the Canadian police with an assumed identity as Czech immigrants. Sixteen years later, their daughter, Evie, learned the astonishing truth from her mother. I remember when I first learned uh, about our true identity, I couldn't believe it because for years we had cheered on the Czechoslovakian team against the evil Russians. And then to suddenly realize, you know, that I was one of those <laughs> Russians. It was a little uh, staggering. One of Gazenko's revelations was a KGB agent in, in who was elected a member of parliament. He was a communist in there. Uh, so you had the only spy we've ever caught in this country, spy, real spy, not just traitor or, or agent of influence, but spy was a member of parliament, um, thanks to Gazenko. For years and years and years the Canadian government would not, uh, for instance, give me a medal for it, or, or to Guzenko and his wife. They want to conserve the name of Mackenzie King to say that he was a great prime minister, my foot. He was anything but. Well, of course, spying is a dirty trade, and uh, we all know it, Khrushchev had said so. During the Second World War, Ian Fleming worked for British Naval Intelligence, visiting Camp X and the offices of British Security Coordination, and came to know Stevenson. Here was Bill Stevenson, the head of a huge intelligence organization. He had the Minox cameras. He had the gadgetry. He was surrounded by a bevy of beautiful women. Many of the stories Fleming wrote about were inspired by Stevenson. 
Espionage is not regarded by the majority of the public as a dirty trade. They regard it rather as sort of a, a very romantic affair. After the war, Fleming built a house in Jamaica named Goldeneye. His neighbor, Bill Stevenson. Fleming was entranced by the anecdotes of the senior spy, his love of all types of gadgetry, and his affinity for large martinis. Well, Uncle Billy was well known um, for um, drinking quart-sized martinis. Now, that story was promulgated by Ian Fleming, amongst others. Um, but my grandmother always made sure to have quart-sized, what we would think of as iced tea glasses, in order for him to make the sort of martini that he wanted. From their post-war homes in Jamaica and New York, Sir William and Lady Mary settled to their final home in Bermuda. In 1978, Mary died. Bermudians are pretty good at leaving celebrities alone, whether movie stars or whoever they are. They don't bother them, you know, they don't follow them around. I mean, you can go into lunch and you're not going to be bothered by the paparazzi or that sort of thing. So. And plus, it's a very attractive place. So I guess he just, you know, he wanted to live his life in obscurity and that was a place to do it. You know, in my experience, a limited experience, uh, dealing with professional spies or spooks or whatever you want to call it, uh, there's a certain similarity. Uh, they don't answer questions directly. They won't tell you anything directly. They talk in innuendo and suggestions. And if you ask a question, they reply with a question. You, you're left with a certain impression. Uh, this was certainly true with Sir William. The legacy of Sir William Stevenson has been tainted by controversy and obscured by official secrecy. Histories of intelligence operations during the Second World War largely ignore his contribution. In Britain, the press has been particularly hostile. Spies don't usually talk. That's why it's called secret service. Stevenson was an outsider. He wasn't part of the British elite. His views were completely unsympathetic to the Nazis, unlike much of the British elite. Nearly every book that has been written on Stevenson has been written by people with connections to either the British government or British intelligence. These are the people Stevenson was hired to bypass. But in retrospect, Stevenson didn't even tell them who he really was or where he came from. In January 1989, Sir William Stevenson died in Bermuda. Only a handful of mourners attended his funeral and no announcement was made until after his burial. A life of intrigue had come to a close. A recent history of the Central Intelligence Agency, published years after his death, finally acknowledged Stevenson as a major architect. There would have been no CIA without Bill Donovan and Bill Stevenson. So his contribution uh, to American intelligence uh, was just about as fundamental as it could be. Stevenson, I think you could say he was an observer always. He would come into a situation and he would sit back and observe who was uh, uh, pulling the strings and all. And eventually, Stevenson would be the one to give the direction. And I, I saw him do that many times. And, uh, but he was the most modest person I think I ever knew. There is correspondence uh, between my mother and Sir William in which she thanks him for saving their lives. Uh, she felt in her heart that he must be the person behind the scenes who was instrumental in the decision to allow them to stay in Canada and uh, to encourage that they would be given a new identity and protected. I think that if he were alive today, he would be a very powerful nuisance to the, the terrorists. His whole life was dedicated to trying to defeat the enemies of civilization. Good intelligence, in fact, intelligence, uh, uh, whether good or bad, but uh, knowledge of the, what the enemy is up to when he's likely to strike, and to strike before he does, is absolutely essential in this day of uh, uh, practically uh, complete uh, oblivion if the enemy does strike first. 